the 100. Um, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is David Miles. I'm a professor of uh, financial economics here at Imperial College, and I'd like to welcome you to this seminar uh, hosted at the Brevin Howard Center uh, of Imperial College, the Brevin Howard Center specializing in uh, analysis of all aspects of financial markets. It's a research group that sits within the business school at Imperial College, and we're very glad to have so many of you join us this afternoon to talk about pensions and the pros and cons, maybe a little bit more of the cons from John than the pros, of collective defined contribution pension schemes. There's a great deal of interest, as many of you will know, in this issue, particularly within universities, given the woes of the university superannuation scheme. Some people see going down the road of trying to turn the scheme into something akin to a collective defined contribution scheme as um, the sort of path to salvation um, and there are others who are rather skeptical about whether that's a sensible move and we are very fortunate this afternoon I think to have John Ralph with us to help us think through those issues. John uh, I know that the overwhelming proportion of you will know John very well and you don't need me to say much about him except that he is one of the world's leading experts on pension issues, a wealth of knowledge, a formidable record of insightful analysis of really all uh, kinds of issues to do with pensions and advisor to many schemes and to governments. John's going to talk to us for um, about half an hour or so and I'll ask people um, to uh, hold off with questions and observations until John's finished. I'll, I'll then lead off the discussion and I hope we'll have plenty of time given the very large audience this afternoon we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers certainly at least 30 minutes for that and we'll aim to wrap up at about 20 past 25 past for um, about an hour and a quarter from now so John let me not waste any more time waffling on um, let me hand over to you John Ralph on um, the pros and cons of collective DC schemes Okay, thanks very much for that introduction, David. Um, we're st I'm still slightly struggling with the technology. I'm going to switch off my video, so you won't be able to see me, and I'm then going to try and share the screen. So let me stop my video, yeah. Uh, that's good, John, we can, we can see your slides. At least you can I see can. the slides, right, okay, that's brilliant. Um, well, let's, let's kick off. We all know that in the UK and the US and the Netherlands, for that matter, private sector defined benefit pensions have been gradually closing for the last 20 years. And this has accelerated in the UK in the last three or four years. Many uh, UK companies, such pension bellwethers as BT, John Lewis and British Airways, have all pulled the DB plug. And it's difficult to name half a dozen companies in the FTSE 350 who still have DB schemes. So rather than a DB pension promising an inflation linked pension for life, private sector pensions are almost all defined contribution with no guaranteed pension. Individuals taking their own longevity and investment risk through drawing down their pension pot in retirement. Collective defined contribution pensions aim to bridge the gap between DB and DC. CDC offers an annual target pension to members based on employer and employee contributions. And each year, the total target pensions are valued and compared with the value of assets. The assets are more than the value of target pensions. Target pensions are increased. If assets are less, then target pensions are reduced. So this means that target pensions, and this includes pensions in payment, are flexed up or down, so they're automatically kept in balance with assets. This can, of course, mean that pensioners see their pensions cut. I'm very pleased that we've got uh, quite a few people from the Netherlands uh, on, the, uh, on the call today. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about what's going on in 
uh, in the Netherlands, because I may well get it wrong. Dutch CDC has been around for about 15 years, but it's important to say it wasn't set up from scratch. It was an attempt to rescue DB when the Dutch courts ruled in the early 2000s that Dutch employers, unlike their UK or US counterparts, had no legal obligation to make deficit contributions. So what does that mean? Despite what everyone thought, Dutch DB pensions were not really DB. And I was told by one of my Dutch friends a few years ago, uh, and I'll spare his blushes because I know he is on the call, that CDC was set up to look like DB to members and look like DC on company balance sheets. And after stumbling into D CDC, the Netherlands is now in the process of moving to DC. In the UK, the pensions bill, including CDC, has just received royal assent. And Royal Mail has said, and so far it's the only company, has said it intends to start CDC for its 140,000 staff as soon as possible. CDC was agreed by Royal Mail and the unions in 2018 to avert a strike when the company was finally closing its DB scheme. Royal Mail and the unions have pushed the government to allow CDC and government ministers were only too happy to be pushed. Um, like any savings product, CDC requires strict regulation, but UK regulation is weak, very weak, and in particular, the valuation assumptions are set by each trustee and actuary. Contrast this with the Netherlands, which I don't think is perfect by any means, but in the Netherlands, assumptions on valuing target pensions are based on market bond yields set by regulation. Royal Mail set out the details of what its CDC plan uh, would do in November 2018. Uh, member contributions 4%, company contributions 11.2%, retirement age of 67, um, an annual target pension of 180th, and the aim is to increase that target pension at CPI plus 1% a year or about RPI. It's important that as part of this, Royal Mail is closing its DC scheme. So the staff, 140,000 staff, cannot choose DC or CDC. They have to go into the CDC. There's a separate cash lump sum in the arrangement guaranteed by Royal Mail, but I won't be talking about that today. Well, unbelievably, and I really do mean unbelievably, Royal Mail CDC will hold 100% equities up to the normal retirement age of 67. And they and the unions claim that CDC can deliver the same pension as a 160th DB with a very low risk of pensions being cut despite holding 100% equities. We know from its accounts that when Royal Mail closed its DB scheme in 2018, that the 160th DB pension cost about 47% of salary. So the total CDC contribution, including the amount for the cash lump sum, is just 20%. How on earth can it deliver the same as the old DB? Well, as we know, CDC fans claim that it can turn base metal into gold, deliver a much higher overall pension than DB, annuities or DC with drawdown uh, for the same contribution or with a very low risk. Uh, supposedly, CDC captures the higher expected returns on holding equities, 100% equities in this case, but reduces this risk by what's described as intergenerational risk sharing. I want to look very carefully at how this CDC intergenerational risk sharing works, both in general and the Royal Mail arrangement in particular. And I want to look at why the Royal Mail version of CDC is just not fair. And when I say not fair, I don't mean just around the edges. I mean outrageously unfair. I want to look at some of the theory behind the concepts of fairness. And I've had various discussions with people about what does fairness in pensions mean. This, of course, is fair in this John Rawls sense of fair behind the veil of ignorance. My starting point for CDC fairness, it, it's pretty straightforward. Simply that you can only take out as a pension what you've put in 
plus the investment returns. And the other side of that coin, if you do take out more than you've put in, then you're taking somebody else's savings. We'll be coming back to this uh, a bit later. So we can be clear about where we're heading. I want to start with my conclusions. And I also want to start with what CDC can genuinely do, which DC can't, and what CDC, despite its cheerleaders, can't really do any better than DC. Um, so what can CDC do that DC can't? Well, some fans suggest it can achieve greater economies of scale, so it'll have lower annual fees and be better run than DC. But of course, we shouldn't compare CDC with the best DC around. We should, sorry, we should compare CDC with the best DC around, not the average, which for me is Nest, the UK's auto enrolment savings vehicle set up by the government with about four and a half million people low cost and transparent. Uh, it's worth pointing out, by the way, that CDC is great for actuaries uh, because there's always got to be at least one actuary involved. Uh, you could even describe it as make work for actuaries. Let's think about longevity. DC certainly can't manage longevity risk. If you live longer than average, you'll run out of money. Uh, and if you don't live as long as average, you may have a poorer standard of living because you're not spending enough. But the good news is that you know your unused pension can be transferred to family members. CDC manages longevity risk by pooling individual longevities across members. This is a genuine benefit, but of course members dying early pay for those dying late. There's a cost to this insurance, and that's giving up your unused pension savings if you do die early. From a behavioural point of view, we know that people really, really, really do not like annuities. Uh, and my guess is that many people, most people, would choose being able to leave their unused pension to family members over longevity insurance and therefore prefer DC. Discussing uh, CDC longevity insurance is a bit of a side issue. CDC isn't being pushed because of longevity insurance. It's being pushed because of claims it can produce a higher, less risky pension than DC with drawdown. What I want to show is that a fair CDC just can't turn base metal into gold. It can't capture the higher expected returns of equities, but with a lower risk. And that in a fair CDC, for any given identical level of equity allocation, the investment returns and the risk, the volatility, are identical to DC. And I know it sounds a bit arrogant, but I don't think this is a matter of judgment where two right-minded people could disagree. I want to show, as a matter of fact, that the fair CDC does nothing which DC cannot do which perhaps shouldn't be too surprised about this, since CDC is just DC, it relies on defined contributions and investment returns, and that's all. It has nobody standing in the background, no company standing in the background to make deficit contributions. Remember the motto, you can only take out what you've put in. Well, Royal Mail CDC, and it doesn't have to be this way, of course, but Royal Mail CDC is designed to be structurally unfair to younger members. It's not an accident or an unintended consequence. Pensioners take more than they put out, uh, plus the investment returns. But the over-generous pensions don't come from thin air. They have to be paid from somewhere. And guess what? They're paid from the savings of younger members. Intergenerational risk sharing sounds very cuddly, but the Royal Mail version is really intergenerational uh, pocket picking. And the Royal Mail CDC is a, is a shameful con. And I don't say it lightly, I think it's a shameful con by the company, by the union, by the government, by the three actuarial firms on the payroll. So let's look at a worked example of what I mean by Royal Mail CDC picking pockets. 
Let's look at two members with the same salary. £30,000. They've both been in the scheme for five years. So they've both made the same cash contribution. They both have the same target pension. The difference is that one of the members joined age 61 and is now 66, a year away from retirement. And the other joined at 21 and is now just 41 years away from retirement, age 26. At the end of five years, both members ask for a transfer value. As their contributions are identical, you'd think the transfer value would also be identical, about £26,500 each, five years contributions and a, uh, a bit of investment returns. Well, that isn't, as a matter of fact, how the Royal Mail transfer values will work. And the details are all set out on the, uh, on the note to members and there's a, there's a URL uh, in, in the slide a bit further back. The, the Ulster gets something like £32,000 as a transfer value, and the youngster gets something like 16000 So obviously the youngster has seen their pocket picked for £8,000 or a third of their share. Now let's look at it slightly differently. Let's suppose, let's look at what happens if instead of taking a transfer value, both members simply draw their pensions from the normal retirement age of 67. Royal Mail assumes a 5% annual return every single year. And if this is achieved, and let's leave to one side whether we think that is realistic or not, how long do the oldest contributions plus those 5% returns last? Well, the answer is um, that it runs out by about age 82. Now that's not good news because the average life expectancy that's assumed, including the spouse's pension, is about 89. So how are the extra seven years paid for? Well, again, they can only come from one place. They're pinched on the savings of younger members. What about the 26 year old with a whopping 41 years to retirement, compounding at the Royal Mail assumed 5% a year? Well, their contributions plus assumed returns are so much by the time they retire that they never run out of money. The 5% assumed investment returns are more than enough to pay the pension forever. This picture, by the way, is of two Royal Mail uh, CDC members. The youngster's in the process of handing out over to the oldster a parcel containing a big chunk of her savings. Let's try and tease out why we get this bizarre conclusion with the Royal Mail CDC. Well, the first thing is that Royal Mail CDC offers the same flat rate target pension to all members, regardless of age. And although it discounts target pensions at 5%, it does not compound the cash contribution to give a higher target pension to youngsters. People get no credit for the time value of money. And the youngster gets no credit for being further away from retirement than the oldster. So it seems to me, even on its own terms, Royal Mail CDC is structurally unfair. If it discounts target pensions at 5%, it should also compound them at 5%. But there's another separate issue. Even if Royal Mail did offer age-related target pensions, the 5% discount rate Royal Mail uses to calculate the present value of target pensions and transfer values is far too high. It should be calculated using a neutral market interest rate, not CPI plus 3%, which is uh, Royal Mail's assumption, but say 1%. So in other words, 3%, not 5%. Because Royal Mail CDC uses the expected return on assets as a discount rate, it understates the target pensions and overstates the funding. This means target pensions are just too high, and the pensions paid out to current pensioners are too high. Some of you have seen the actuary's magic pencil before, 
And in DB, the actor is magic pencil could make assets look bigger than they really were and make liabilities and annual costs look smaller than they really were. And guess what? There's also a CDC actor is magic pencil. This can make CDC assets look bigger than they really are. And the present value of target pensions looks smaller than they really are. Royal Mail CDC, uh, dare I say, exactly as bad DB used to do, it recognises expected equity outperformance before that outperformance is achieved. And it pays it out to existing pensioners. And because the expected equity outperformance has not yet been earned, and it's paid out from the savings of younger members. Let's get some overall, overall idea of how much Royal Mail overstates its level of funding. Well, let's suppose the assets are 100 million pounds and at the expected return on assets of 5%, the target pensions are 100 million, 100% funded. If we use 3%, not 5%, the present value of target pensions balloons to 150 million, which means that the CDC is only about two thirds funding, uh, funded and to bring it back into balance, target pensions, including pensions in payment, should be reduced by uh, about a third. I think we have a strange past the parcel Ponzi, where in the Royal Mail CDC, the first cohort pinches from the second cohort, but when the second cohort become pensioners, they pinch from the third, which in turn pinches from the fourth. Each succeeding generation uh, passes the parcel to the preceding generation. Fantastic, but what happens when you're the last in the queue? The penultimate cohort will gladly pinch from you, but by definition, there's no subsequent cohort you can pinch from. Uh, logically, rationally, no one wants to, be the, wants to be in the last cohort, so it seems to me that no one would ever join the CDC and risk being the last in line. End to end, of course, the first cohort benefits at the expense of the last cohort. Um, let's just think about some, under, some of the underlying theory of CDC fairness. I think we're very clear and everybody acknowledges this as a, a, as a very big issue, that the fundamental DC question is, how much can I withdraw from my DC pot each year? And I think Bill Sharp has said it's the most complicated uh, problem in, in finance. And if I choose to withdraw too much, I bear the consequences of having less in the future. If you like, there's only one DC member, so the idea of fairness to members doesn't apply. The fundamental CDC question is pretty much the same. How much can CDC pay out to members each year? CDC chooses to pay out too much, current pensioners gain and non-pensioners lose. Uh, many of you will be familiar with John Rawls' Theory of Justice, which was published 50 years ago in 1971. And it was actually John Rawls' 100th birthday two days ago on Sunday. This is my uh, slightly battered copy, uh, bought, I think, in about 1976. This cost £1.25, by the way. I don't know what that tells us about book inflation. For those of you who are familiar, you'll know that this sets out a framework for how goods should be apportioned to different members in a just society. John Rawls has this, has this phrase, he, he argues that the principles of justice are chosen behind a veil of ignorance. Now it seems to me that this veil of ignorance applies to voluntarily joining any mutual organisation including a, a, a savings plan, including CDC. 
that the CDC annual target pensions and the total target pension and the transfer value must be chosen behind a veil of ignorance with no inherent bias one member to another. This is just simply saying that CDC must be fair to all members. Again, remember the slogan, you can only take out what you put in. Let's think about how this might work in a simple collective savings scheme. Suppose we have a thousand members of different ages. They each earn 30,000 and they each save 15.2% of salary. I don't choose that um, percentage arbitrarily. That's the, uh, the Royal Mail CDC percentage uh, saving, by the way. Members can withdraw their share of the total pot savings plus gains or losses in a lump sum anytime they want. This seems to be pretty straightforward. A fair withdrawal value is just the value of the pot divided by the number of members. So the first member to decide to take out their savings just simply gets one thousandth of the total pot. Suppose it's worth at 24 million pounds after five years. First member gets 24,000 pounds. That seems to be uh, you know, absolutely straightforward. It would just be unfair to give them more or less than £24,000 based on their age. Why on earth should a 30-year-old get less than £24,000? Why should a 60-year-old get more? Well, a CDC pension, uh, you know, has a fancy name, but a CDC pension is just a simple collective saving scheme. Money's going into a collective pot and then money's coming out of a collective pot. Instead of members taking their share of assets in one lump sum, the simple collective saving scheme, CDC is staggered. It's a series of payouts from pension age until death over an average of, say, 20 years from 67 to 87 or whatever it is. But the same principle of fairness to all members must apply whether we're talking about a single payout or a series of CDC payouts over time, over 20 years. Now let's suppose, and this is a bit bizarre, but you'll understand why I'm suggesting it. Let's suppose that our simple collective savings scheme didn't use the market values of assets. What if it said, well, look, we'll add 50% to the market value of equities to take account of their higher expected returns. 24 million pounds market value becomes 32 million adjusted value. So fantastic. The lever, instead of taking 24,000, can take 32,000. Clearly, it's unfair to the stayers. It pinches their money. And for the stayers to be told, don't worry, equities will outperform over time. And it will make up the 8,000 pounds that's just off, walked off with your lever doesn't really work. But this is exactly what happens with Royal Mail CDC. Um, I said we would talk about intergenerational risk sharing, which is, it is pitched as the absolute core of CDC. If intergenerational risk sharing doesn't mean anything, or it doesn't work, or it doesn't do anything which DC can't do, then it's a bust flush. Now, there's been a lot of absolutely crazy talk in the last two or three years about how much more generous CDC is than DB or annuities or DC. We've seen, we've all seen figures of 20%, 40%, I think even 70%. And these crazy figures for, are from individuals and actuarial firms who should know better. It's worth repeating that the, the Dutch and the UK case CDC schemes started out as DB. And CDC has been pitched you know, in the Netherlands and in, in the UK as DB light. Has most of the advantages of DB, but not quite. Uh, I had a conversation with somebody, and I'm, I'm still not sure whether they were joking. Uh, they said, well, CDC is just like DB, except there's no company guarantor. 
Exactly. CDC isn't DB Light, it's just DC. There is no company standing behind to make deficit contributions and guarantee the promise. DB and annuities are guaranteed, and we all know guarantees are very expensive. So to compare guaranteed DB with CDC, which isn't guaranteed, is apples and oranges. Framing the discussion as how does CDC differ from DB is the wrong place to start. It's a comfortable place to start. It allows you to create a bit of a smokescreen, but it's the wrong place to start. The right place to start is how does CDC differ from DC with drawdown? You put money in, it is invested, you take, um, you take a risk on the assets that you're investing in and you then draw it down gradually uh, from retirement. By definition, if the asset allocation for CDC and DC is identical, then the investment returns are identical. That's not controversial. The CDC expected investment returns can only be higher than DC if the CDC scheme has a higher allocation to equities than the benchmark DC. Clearly, the other side of higher expected investment returns is higher risk. And we know that Royal Mail and others say it can capture the higher expected equity returns, but at the same time reduce the risk of holding equities via this wonderful intergenerational risk sharing. There are lots and lots and lots of very, very high quality papers uh, written by Dutch academics who debate whether CDC can take on more stock market risk than DC as the risks can be shared with future generations. Uh, interestingly, the conclusion of this debate is not clear cut. And a 2020 paper argues that, quote, optimal risk sharing actually implies that collective pension funds should take less stock market risk, not more. Again, the URL is there. It's a very, very interesting paper. What does this tell us about the UK? Well, it doesn't tell us very much. And it doesn't tell us very much because all the Dutch analysis pro and con takes it for granted that CDC membership is compulsory for all employees and for all future generations, which is the situation that we have in the, in the Netherlands. So even if, I'm not planning to discuss it, but even if CDC with compulsory membership can uh, take on more stock market risk than DC, this is entirely irrelevant to the UK. It doesn't just, it simply doesn't apply to the UK where CDC membership is voluntary. We've had lots and lots of arm waving from UK CDC fans, but no one has explained the theory or the nuts and bolts practice of how UK intergenerational risk sharing can work. Um, to try and understand what intergenerational risk sharing uh, means, Let's just try and make sure we understand what changes, annual changes in the CDC asset values do to target pensions. This is the simple example, Royal Mail will talk about in a moment, slightly more complicated, but it's exactly the same principle. So we've got a thousand members in the CDC and the total assets are 50 million pounds. This CDC offers target pensions, which include an annual CPI inflation increase. Well, if what happens if CDC assets fall? Well, it's pretty straightforward. All target pensions are reduced by the same amount by 20%. A member with a £5,000 target pension plus the annual CPI increases will see it cut by 20% to 4000 if CDC assets increase by 20%, other side of the coin, all target pensions are increased by 20%. Very straightforward, 
easily understood by members, and it's fair. Target pensions are moved up or down on a one-to-one -one basis as CDC assets go up or down and the level of funding changes. Uh, and this, of course, applies whether the CDC happens to have 100% equities, 50% or 20%. But now let's look at what happens to DC if asset values fall by 20%. Suppose instead of a thousand CDC members with total assets of 50 million, we have a thousand individuals, the same thousand individuals, with DC pots of 50,000 each. What happens to their DC target pension if the value of their pot uh, changes? Well, if their assets fall or, or, or rise by 20%, well, the target pension, the amount they expect to be able to draw in retirement moves by 20%. They might, of course, as a second order thing, choose to work longer or retire earlier or save more or, or save less. But if you have a CDC pot, a 20% change means a, a reduction in your target pension to 20%, and the same goes for, uh, for DC. We can see this if we put the two side by side. 20% change in assets moves the CDC target pension and the DC target pension up or down 20% on a one-to-one -one basis. The DC target pension, the CDC target pension changes are identical. There's no CDC intergenerational risk sharing versus D DC. You have exactly the same outcomes in DC or CDC for any change, any fall, any increase in asset values. It seems to me that CDC does nothing to share risk versus DC. The CDC, the DC annual returns and volatility for different generations are identical for any identical asset allocation. The way in which, the way in which Royal Mail intergenerational risk sharing works is a bit different. It's slightly more complicated. Um, uh, and it explains how, how it will work. And it's a bit more complicated because Royal Mail isn't offering target pensions in real inflation adjusted terms, which include annual CPI increases. Instead, it offers a nominal pension with the expectation of annual inflation linked increases. The example that Royal Mail gives, this is uh, an extract from one of their documents. Suppose the average term of pensions is 20 years, the expected annual inflation increases are 3% and assets fall by 20%. Well, under the Royal Mail arrangements, all target pensions are unchanged. And what does change is that the expected annual inflation increases are reduced from 3% to 2%. And a 1% reduction over 20 years gives you a 20% reduction in the total value of target pensions. And that brings the CDC back into balance. John, I'm gonna cut across you a minute. I think you need to speed up a little bit. There's so many questions that I'm really keen that we have enough time to debate yeah, some of the got, issues here. I've got, I've got three or four more slides. Okay, um, well, if you can slides, get through those in, in the next three or four minutes, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, as far as Royal Mail CDC, um, and, and if I don't cover this fully, we can come, we can come back to it in, in questions. How the 1% reduction in expected inflation increases hits the value of an individual member's target pension depends on their age. The 20% is just an average which applies for somebody aged about 55. For older members, 65 say, with a shorter average term to payment, 20% fall in asset values reduces their overall pension by just 10%. For a 25-year-old, it uh, reduces their overall pension value by 40%. Uh, and, and it works the other way if there's an increase. Royal Mail CDC halves the risk and volatility for oldsters versus DC, and it doubles the risk and volatility for youngsters uh, versus DC. 
But of course, this is absolutely crucial. If each member had their own DC port, they can get exactly the same effect simply by changing their own individual asset allocation. Ulsters can halve their risk and volatility by holding 50% uh, equities in DC rather than 100% in CDC. Youngsters can increase their risk by holding 200% in DC. In practice, of course, borrowing to hold shares. What does this mean? Well, it means that the CDC and DC annual returns and volatility are identical. Again, there's no CDC intergenerational risk sharing. CDC doesn't do anything to share risk. Two, two final points, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, although the headline figure is 100% equities for Royal Mail CDC, as we've seen, the economic exposure for youngsters is actually 200%. Royal Mail doesn't bother to explain why 200% is the optimal equity allocation, or even bother to tell younger members they are indeed holding 200% equities. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we know that Nest did a lot of research on this. Very clearly, younger people who've just started saving are risk averse. And perhaps Royal Mail could tell us why their conclusions are so different to, to Nest. And then the final slide. Royal Mail talks about the chances of a cut to pensions, which look pretty low, one in every five, once in every five years and more than 5% cut only once in every 17 years. Royal Mail isn't telling the whole truth. The way in which it defines pension cuts is in nominal, not real terms. For there to be a cut in the nominal pension, it means CDC assets have to fall 50%, and again, this is from uh, a Royal Mail document, have to fall 50% before nominal pensions are cut. And losing 50% of the present value of my pension would certainly worry me. Royal Mail is again creating a smokescreen to encourage real money uh, illusion. Right, um, let, me, let me finish the slides. Let me finish the slides there. Let me stop screen share. And let me switch my video back on. Can everybody see me now? I think we can, John. I think, I think we can. And thank you very much for... Right. Um, finishing pretty much on time. So that, that's wonderful. Um, there's been a very active chat, which you won't have seen, I don't think, during your presentation. And there's lots of people who I know will want to ask questions and I will let them do that very, uh, very soon. I just wanted, if, if I might, to just kick off the discussion with something that I, I found quite difficult to understand during your presentation. At some points, it sounded like a very specific critique of the Royal Mail version of CDC, but at other times it sounded as if you were making a more general set of propositions that any form of intergenerational risk sharing with a CDC scheme is simply impossible, that it's illusory, that actually you could prove almost as a mathematical result that there was nothing you could do with CDC that you could not do with an individual DC scheme. Um, and I think it would be helpful in a minute if I allow you to try and say whether or not you think that CDC in principle, not the Royal Mail version of it, yeah. but just the principle of CDC, could not generate intergenerational risk sharing. I mean, I, 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 it seems I mean, I, to I'm, me... I'm, sorry, sorry, David. I, I, I no, no, you're not going to interrupt well, me. Shut up. Yeah. You spoke for a long time. Yes. Stop a minute. I'll let you come back in just a second. <laughs> I, I, it seemed to me that many of the many of the points you were making about the difficulty of intergeneral risk sharing were just that they were pointing out difficulties in design, not that in principle it was simply impossible, because it seems to me that it is at least conceptually possible that if there are indeed independent risks to say a portfolio of equities faced by different generations. And if you could reach an agreement between current and future generations, some of them yet to be born on risk sharing, then there could be in principle the possibility that on average people would get the same return, of course, as they would in DC standalone, but 
that they could reduce the volatility by sharing risk with future generations. Just as you and I, John, if we invested in different shares that were had independent risks and we simply decided to pool our money and just take half of whatever there was, then we would get the same average return. And as long as they weren't perfectly correlated, we could get lower risk. Now, that seems to me absolutely obviously correct. The difficulty is, I think, that if you're trying to share with future generations and you get some bad returns early on and you can't force the future generations to pay some of the cost of that by, of course, having a lower return than they otherwise would to compensate me, the current generation who's been unlucky. If you can't force them to do that, then there is indeed a problem in making the whole thing workable. Is that your point, your general point against CDC, that it's difficult to tie in future generations? Or do you think that even if you could, it would still be uh, illusory? Um, I think uh, Christian Gollier showed in an article uh, probably about 10 years ago now in the Journal of Public Economics that if you started out with a big enough fund, you could guarantee that future generations at least got their money back, which is not the same as them earning the expected return on risky assets. And his argument was that if you started out in a relatively favorable position, you could get into general rational risk sharing in a sustainable way and without forcing future generations to stay in the scheme. But it only works if you start out in a favorable position. A long-winded question, the first of many that will come. Do you just want to respond to that? To what extent is your critique yeah. specific to Royal Mail or a general point about all CDC schemes? There are at least 14 questions there, uh, at least 14 questions there, David. Um, I I've written quite a lot of shortish articles on why Royal Mail is, is unfair. And I took that for granted. When I started to think about CDC again, which was before Christmas, I almost took that for red. I've gone down into some of the detail in the weeds and I've, I've teased out one or two things. The conclusion I expected to reach was Royal Mail happens to be unfair, but you can design a CDC scheme which is both fair and achieve something. Um, the thing that surprised me is I've reached the conclusion that any CDC scheme um, that you can possibly come up with, you can replicate the risks and returns simply by DC with a different asset allocation. Um, I'm not sure that, whether that I want... That is to... equivalent to saying that there can never be under any yes, circumstances yes, intergenerational yes, yes, risk yes, sharing. Yes, yes, yes correct. I, I find that hard to correct. believe. And I think, I think if we're talking about intergenerational risk sharing, and does that mean something in the context of, you know, state pensions, for example? You know, why are we taxed to pay our parents' generation because we expect our children to be taxed to pay us? And I accept all that. Key thing is that that is, that's compulsory and it's part of a legal framework. And I'm not sure whether I want to get drawn into discussing what a, an intergenerational risk sharing with compulsory participation forever and a day, how that might work, because we haven't got that. And where we have got it in the Netherlands, they're actually moving away from it. Um, and you then, you then start having some quite interesting questions about, okay, well, what is the contract that this generation has with the future generation? As long as you don't have any compulsory into compulsory membership, I think the question is redundant. And by the way, even if you do, going back to that paper that's just been published uh, six months ago in, in, the, in the Netherlands, even if you did, there is an argument, a very, uh, you know, to me, a, quite a compelling argument, which says even if you had exactly as you've described, described it, um, uh, there is no benefit to be had by. Uh, investing more in equities, if you like, today for future gen for future generations. I'm going to open it up to a general discussion. I, I suspect that there are a very large number of people. There's 145 of us on on the on the on the call. 
there are a very large number of people who'd like to say something. Um, can I ask people to use the sort of put your hand up? Um, and I, the first hand I see going up is Mark, Mark Rowlandson. Mark, would you like to um, make a comment? Hi, John. Long time, no see. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I suppose, um, yeah, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a few bits to this, but but the, um, um, I mean, just coming back on what John just said then is, is, is I think it's really important to realise that with, with a CDC scheme, it, it's not a case that there's a good time to join or a bad time to join. The, the, the experience to date is, is borne by the, the members of the fund to date. Um, if you join a CDC scheme, you join on a, a, an equal expectation basis that your benefits could be higher or lower than what you um, and initially uh, uh, targeted. So I don't, I, don't, I don't think you need that kind of good times or bad times. There is always the same incentive to join a new CDC scheme. The, the, um, I, I think it's really important to distinguish between, which, which was the point that you made, David, that, that between this idea of, of, of what Royal Mail were doing with their scheme and, and that as a, that kind of fairness argument around contributions versus a CDC scheme, because it, effectively, what Royal Mail are doing is exactly the same as what we have with DV pensions in terms of the accrual rates or for the numerous schemes that are out there with age-related contribution scales. Um, now, I totally get the arguments as to why people might judge them as unfair, um, but they exist and it was a kind of settled argument when we had the uh, age discrimination um, regulations. And the, the last thing I'd just say really is that, is that the CDC is not, is not some magic bullet. It really, it really isn't in that sense. It's, you know, it, it is, it is, still DC and, and if, if, if investments do badly over a long period of time people will still do badly. It, it is a DC scheme fundamentally um, but it, it, it's, it's about um, and, and this is the fundamental of it which actually is, is where John started from the right place is fairness is, is the key thing here. It's about how do you define fairness and if you define fairness as John does as being purely about you've got to get back exactly what you put in well, CDC doesn't work, it's unfair. You're never gonna like it because that's not what it does. Um, but if you define fairness a bit, a bit wider than that as being, as being about um, um, not, not doing materially worse for somebody who retires in 2009 compared to 2015, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a, big, a different type of fairness, um, trying to even out the outcomes among, among the generations. And that, that's what CDC is trying to do. Um, along, along with the, um, the inbuilt insurance uh, longevity. Um, so I, I think it's that fairness definition that, that, that yeah. really matters. Uh, okay, that, that, that was very interesting, Mark, and I agree with some and I disagree with that. I wasn't sure, so I'm not being pratty. What was the specific question there, or should we move on to somebody else? Uh, no, not if you don't want to answer any, any of that. No, if you don't want to respond to that, then, then, then no, there's no. There's I, no think, I think I think the, smooth, the smoothing argument and two people in you know 2009, 2015. How do you smooth as an individual in your DC pot? Um, you, you you do what everybody does, which is you gradually move from equities to bonds as you approach retirement. That's how you smooth, and a CDC doesn't do anything more or less. And what an individual can do um, themselves by moving from um, more risky to, to less risky. So I, th I think the smoothing argument doesn't, doesn't get you anywhere. And by the way, the argument isn't really about smoothing. It's you get more, you get more for your money. Well, 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 well you get more I... for your money because oh, the sorry. smoothing is moved later, effectively. So I think, I think that is a key part of where, where it does it, because it moves that, to, you, you get time horizon diversification. Uh, and so you don't need to take that risk off quite so soon. And that, that, that's where the extra benefit kind of comes through. John, can I, can I frame a question which I, I think is, prompt, is prompted by, by something Mark just said while, while I wait for a few more hands to come up? I'm sure there are lots of people that, that want to ask questions. And, um, and it's this. Mark, Mark suggested something that occurred to me as you were speaking, whereas I think a few times you were saying that fairness means you, you get out whatever you put in. Of course, if you mean by that, that let's keep track of the amount of money that you've made as a contribution and what the rate of return on that money is given the assets that were bought with it, and I have to get that much money. If you define fairness in that way, of course, you're completely right. There can't be any intergenerational risk sharing. There can't be any kind of risk sharing. But 
you must mean more than that because that's that's without wishing to be rude. I mean, that's a trivial result. That's just saying if you force it to be DC, it's equivalent to DC. Yes, I agree. I, I, it sounds like a trivial result, but it's actually it's actually a very profound result. And it's a profound result because if you say, well, what again, coming back to what does CDC as a matter of fact do that DC doesn't? Go back to the example, uh, assets go up 20%, well, your target pension goes up 20%. Assets go down 20%, your target pension goes down 20%. So what? Fair CDC can be made to be work, can be made to work, but it's a damn squid. It doesn't do anything that you can't simply do yourself by changing your own your own asset allocation. You have said that several times. I, I must admit, I'm somewhat skeptical of that. Are you no. are you saying that Christian Gollier's paper is simply well, wrong? Uh, it's wrong. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that. I don't know that paper. I don't, okay. To be honest, I don't okay. know that paper. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to get drawn into that. But again, okay. come Fair back enough. to you've got you've got a thousand people in a CDC, and you've got a thousand individuals with fifty thousand pounds. They've 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 saved the same amount of money. The total is the same. What happens? CDC assets go up twenty percent. Your target pension goes up twenty percent. What happens in DC? Your target pension. The amount that you expect to be able to draw in retirement also goes up 20 percent. You can have all sorts of complicated mechanisms to do with uh, with, with smoothing. And that's and that's brilliant. But it doesn't increase the total amount that, it, it, you know, the total amount of, of pension pot. And if you have course, a situation, of course, of course. If you have a situation where if you're an individual and you want to smooth, you're saying to yourself, um, I'm approaching retirement, I cannot afford to have my pension cut. What do you do? Again, you do whatever everybody, everybody actually does, as a matter of fact, with DC. You know, um, uh, they move their target asset allocation increasingly de risk, um, uh, 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 de risk over time. So, behaviorally, people do exactly this, can do exactly the same thing. They can get exactly the same outcome and they can be in control of their own asset allocation. Okay, I'm going to open it up. There's a few more questions. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan R. I'm sorry, that's that's all I can see is, is your name. Would you like to? Yeah, it's just, just, to pick up some, right. just to pick up some of the discussion in the chat, which is drawing the parallel with, um, the, with profits policies that we saw in the insurance regime, I guess, particularly going back kind of 20, 30 years ago. And what lessons would you say CDC has and hasn't drawn from those with profit policies and, and where we ended up? Um, hello, Jonathan. Well, I I'm possibly the wrong person to ask. We know that um, with profits policies, we're supposed to do exactly what we've been talking about. They were supposed to smooth, they were supposed to give longevity insurance they were supposed to they were supposed to end up with a um, with a with, with an overall better outcome i'm not sure whether you can still buy with profits in the in the uk i mean certainly um their reputation has been completely shot to pieces and why was it shot to pieces it was shot to pieces mainly because and, and you probably know you certainly know a lot more about this than i do jonathan it was because the decision makers advised by their actuaries allowed more money to be paid out uh, to pensioners to be actually drawing pensions because oh my god we can't actually uh, cut uh, cut pensions in payment so i'm not quite sure what lessons have been drawn i think one lesson that's been drawn and uh, it's very clear in the dwp response to the consultation document of a, of a year a year or so back that cdc isn't allowed to have any um, uh, build up any reserves, but the changes in uh, target pensions from one year to the next have to be based on the actual asset. So you can't actually you can't actually hold uh, hold, hold hold money back. Um, and that might be an answer to your question that you know that's one of the ways in which the response has been uh, people have responded to to with profit. But I think the 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 general point is we had you know, 20 or 30 years of people trying to do something which sounds very similar to CDC and 
uh, with profits and failing dism dismally. Is the lack of reserves a good thing? I'm not sure where the reserves would come from. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no insurance company to provide a reserve. There's no company to provide a reserve. Uh, are individuals going to chip in uh, part of their contribution as a reserve? Well, again, why, why would they? What, what, uh, again, why would they? Why should they? We've got a question. I can see there's a few hands up. Um, and um, the first hands I've seen is uh, Hans, Hans van Meerten. Would you like to um, make your comment, Hans? I can see your there hands, uh, but uh, oh, there you go. Great. Over to Is you. it working? Yes. Yeah, Is we can hear you. you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, John, and uh, thank you all. Very interesting and lively debate. Uh, I wish sometimes we had that in the Netherlands as well. As a side note, um, I was wondering. I did some research into what I call CIDC, CDC, and DB. So collective individual defined contribution versus CDC schemes. And I noticed there was a lot of confusion basically in terms. So what do we exactly mean by CDC or what do we exactly mean by DCC, IDC? So John, if I can ask you, um, when you refer to CDC, do you refer to the, what I would call the Dutch CIDC or do you refer to as the CDC slash money purchase slash Royal Mail variant? Thank you. Um, uh, it sort of comes back to David's question. I think it's a, I think it's a bit of both, and I know that uh, you know the Netherlands is in the process of, of changing, and they don't really want to, uh, you know, abandon CDC, and maybe the maybe the name is being changed or, or whatever. Um, but CDC, uh, as as we described in the you know in the first couple of slides, you put your money into a collective savings vehicle. Uh, you don't you don't own uh, you don't own individual shares. Um, you earn a target pension, and that target pension goes up or down in relation to um, the funding and the value of the assets that are being held. Um, Baz Verka, we've got a question you'd like to ask, and then I know that Bernard Casey um, has been waiting patiently. So, Baz, can you go? Can you ask your question first, and then Bernard, um, you've been very patient. We'll move on to you in, a, in just a moment. Yes, uh, thank you. So this, it's indeed a very lively debate and we have been having that debate in the Netherlands as, as well. And one thing that I learned from that is that you have to be precise in your definitions and in particular also precise on the definition of what intergenerational risk sharing is. And so I think it's useful to, in any case, agree on when there is no intergenerational risk sharing. And that would be the case where if you pay a premium and in return for that, you get a pension in due time. If the market value the actuarial value of the pension that you get at due time is always equal to the premium that you paid and there is no intergenerational risk sharing and I fully agree with John, you can always replicate that in an individual DC. Um, so we define roughly intergenerational risk sharing as that there may be a difference between the value of the premium that you pay and the value of the pension that you get in return. And if that's the case, then of course you can have people sharing in previous losses so they can participate also in the risk return uh, trade-off in the past relative to them. And then there is, and that's what Goliath shows, some welfare gains. But that strongly de de depends, of course, on the possibility to make people pay for losses that also might have occurred in the past. So you need mandatory participation, otherwise it doesn't work. So I guess that that might solve actually a bit of the debate. Um, a final comment, and it's, it's more like a comment than a question, is that for me that's different from the, the question of what an appropriate discount rate is. So we can have discount rate discussions, and we can have intergenerational risk sharing discussions, and in some sense, they are independent of each, uh, of each other. Thanks, Baz. If, if, I might, if, if I might add just one thing very briefly. Um, in the early part of Gollier's paper, he does assume compulsory membership. But he then goes on to show some results without compulsory membership. So Gollier does not always assume there's compulsory membership. Um, John, sorry, I interrupted you before you responded to that. No, no, I, 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 I was just thanking. I was just thanking Buzz for that uh, for that helpful comment. Okay, Bernard, are you there, Bernard Casey? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can. Hi, and, Bernard. Um, I was trying to pitch this a little bit um, more widely. Um, a few weeks ago, or three or three months ago, um, the Royal Mail scheme, rather well, specifically, was the subject of a lecture series on moral philosophy. Um, so that was the title. It was not about pensions except um, as an example, but I wondered whether you, John, could contribute to the debate on what you understand by moral behaviour is with respect to pensions. You raised um, roles briefly, but I wonder whether you could say more and try and contribute to the moral philosophy debate in the same way as a moral philosopher tried to contribute to the pensions debate. Thank you. Uh I mean, that's a, that's a, a very a fascinating question. I'm not sure how many moral philosophers, however, we've got on the call. How many of the 118 uh, people? We can we can maybe discuss I'm that as a... I'm not quite sure how many um, pensions experts we had on the moral philosophy lecture either. Well, that, that might be right. Can, can, can we leave that one and um, discuss something that's a bit more pensions orientated? Um... Richard, Richard Fulmer, you've uh, got your hand up. Richard, over to you. Yes, hello. I'm really trying to understand this better. Um, so forgive this, <laughs> this question, but there's been a lot of talk about intergenerational risk sharing. Now, I assume there's also intragenerational risk sharing going on in these schemes. In other words, uh, if you die young, the, the money that you otherwise would have received if you had kept living essentially ends up being used, used to subsidize people who live older, right? Mortality credit kind of thing going on. Now, um, so that's one question, right? So if the answer to that is no, then my next question is moot. But um, you also mentioned that these this Royal Mail scheme allows people to take a lump sum whenever they wish, right? They can just withdraw all their assets if they wish. Wouldn't that pretty much destroy the any kind of longevity pooling because you know if you get a bad report from your doctor you're just going to withdraw all the money and mortality <laughs> will be much lower yeah uh, so i should say for the other other people in the call richard is a is a well-known longevity expert so i've got to be a bit careful about what i say here i mean you're absolutely right we talked about it a little bit cdc you know doesn't doesn't share longevity risk CDC does. I think there's lots and lots of very good work that you're doing, Richard, and other people are doing to try and come up with some product uh, other than annuity which can share longevity risk. And, and to me, that is the, you know, that is the, the, uh, the thing that we should be spending our time and effort and energy on. Um, as far as adverse selection, so you get a bad re report from your, your doctor. I, I mean, I, I think in the UK, um, in a DB scheme, that is just how it works. You know, you can you can you can you can take a transfer value at any time, and you could have a a CDC scheme with a rule that says you can't transfer your money out into a, a DC pot when you choose to. But it would just seem to me um, uh, that would make it even more even more unattractive. So you're saying, well, look, you're telling me I've got to save this save this money but you're also telling me that I'm, I'm stuck with it forever and a day i'm pretty sure that in the netherlands you can't take a, a transfer value so there is that you know you 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 you're there you're there forever and a day um so i think the answer to the question is there's always going to be adverse selection when it comes to longevity and i'm not sure how you i'm not sure how you get around that maybe maybe it's one of the things that you're working on um, richard all right. Well, interesting. I like I say, I'm still trying to understand how the Royal Mail scheme works. <laughs> yeah, aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> Especially Royal Mail. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Kevin. Kevin's had Kevin. You've had your hand up for a little, a little while. Sorry, it's taken a while to get to you. Do you want to um, unmute yourself and? No problem. Thanks. I, I can probably pick up some of those Hi, points, these points that people have raised. Uh, we've been having conversations on the chat about differences with the Netherlands and with profits, which are interesting. 
I think the point I would make to people is look at the UK legislation. It has learned from the experiences of those two places. Look in particular at the definitions of target benefits. Look at the transparency that's involved in the UK process and the fact that it does not apply to past benefits, which in my opinion was one of the issues with the Netherlands. So the UK has learned from some of these other areas that are always held up as uh, the reason why CDC inevitably fails. John inevitably spent, as he likes to, lots of time about the unfairness of the particular CD, uh, Royal Mail CDC design. And most of his argument centers around what's the alternative and the alternative ought to be a uniform DC contribution that was available to everybody. Interesting, we never had that legislation when people ran DB schemes in the UK. We never said if you want a DB scheme where the cost increases with age, you have to offer a cost neutral alternative or a single alternative contribution rate for everybody. So it's never been obvious to me why that should stop somebody setting up a CDC scheme with a design which replicates a, a DB uh, style benefit. Uh, I think the real question is, how does the operation of the CDC scheme work? Does that in itself give rise to any unfairness to members? And, and my answer has always been no. Uh, John, John made the point about target benefits. What happens if the market drops in comparison with the DC scheme? Because I think you actually, David, you, you got the question right, which was, a lot of John's comments were about the specifics of the Royal Mail rather than CDC in general. If, if assets drop 20%, members do not see their benefits cut by 20%. They might see the value of their benefits cut, but what they actually experience is for that one year, a 1% lower increase. And that's massive difference between DC and CDC. So the way in which market changes are reflected in the benefits payable to members, and that's something that an individual DC cannot replicate. The other question for John, with his challenge that CDC can't do anything that DC uh, can, or DC can do anything that CDC can, what about longevity pooling? What about that longevity pooling? And by the way, the answer to um, Richard's question is, in the Royal Mail system, uh, transfer values are not allowed after you've started to receive your benefit. So you can transfer out brackets, exercise longevity or adverse selection if you like, but you can't do that once the benefits have been paid. It's not perfect, but it's a fair compromise. But the, the fact that a CDC scheme allows members to pool longevity risk, that means they can take a higher risk profile, John, than one member on their own. Do you want to respond to that, John? Um, uh, I think my, res my response is that um, Kevin's being a bit disingenuous. Well, not, no, that's a bit unfair, not a bit disingenuous. But it's worth pointing out that Kevin worked for the firm that advised Royal Mail on the design of um, the CDC scheme, which means he knows quite a lot about it. But it also means uh, he has a, a bit of a vested, a bit of a vested interest. You, you argue, Kevin, that a twenty percent fall in the asset values has less of an impact on a CDC member than somebody with their own DC pot. I just don't get that. So the twenty percent fall in the um, uh, in asset values for the CDC member means, as you say. Uh, expected inflation increases go down by one percent. If I'm a, if I have my own D, my own DC pot, and uh, uh, assets go down twenty percent, I simply say to myself, well, you know what, I'm going to have a slightly less generous uh, retirement, because the expectation is that instead of um, uh, the amount that I can take out going up by three percent, it goes up at two percent. The impact is, in, is absolutely the same in the CDC and in the DC. There is no difference whatsoever. No, no difference in the sense that the assets might have gone down by 
there is a difference in how that is experienced and you should be following through what does it mean to, I'm a member in drawdown in your world I've suffered 20% drop in my pension DC pot what do I do and I suspect the answer is I make sure I don't get in that position by taking a more defensive position in relation to drawdown. And I think that's one of the subtleties that you've missed. What, what, what you do, Kevin, is you say, at the moment I'm drawing £10,000, and I was hoping that that would go up at 3% a year, which is the expectation uh, with the Royal Mail CDC. Well, actually, I'm going to have to tighten my belt slightly, and uh, it's only going, to have to, uh, only going to be able to increase it to 2% a year. So it's not just the fall is... The fall of 20% is identical. Of course it is. That's our, that's our hypothesis. The way in which the individual CDC member sees that and the way in which the individual DC member sees that, it's absolutely the same. It just means in both cases, you tighten your belt. No, no, <laughs> the, the, think how it's experienced. In one case, a member gets a letter, dear pension scheme member, your pension this year will be going up by 2%. In the other case, this member who's taken responsibility for managing his DC pot sees his pot has dropped 20% in value. And, and what does he do? He says, well, in that, case, in that case, in order to, 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 not, to, not, uh, you know, to not outlive my pot, the amount that I take each year, I was expecting it to be 3% uh, increase, it's only going to be 2%. Do you, I don't know whether we've got other questions, David. I don't want to... Uh, I Get think we're, 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 we're getting very close to um, the time I said we were going to aim, aim to wrap things up by. Um, I don't see any more hands up at the moment. If there is somebody who's got a last question, um, even though you haven't put your hand up, do, do unmute yourself and, and chip in. I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, no. can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, I yes, please do, please do. I mean, just on that last point, I mean, I actually looked at what people in the Netherlands did in the few years ago when the system in the Netherlands actually started delivering cuts in um, either no inflation increase because they weren't obliged to, or in fact, actual cuts in pension. I actually looked at the behavior of members. And one of the things that was rather interesting about that is the way in which people in the Netherlands valued their pension schemes and the extent to which they trusted them. And I looked at data uh, which looked at trust in financial institutions, which included banks and a number of other things. And what one found was that these Dutch pension schemes, which everybody had been upholding for years as being the best example of anything, that trust in them at that time dropped quite dramatically. Um, so people did get concerned when something did happen, even if it was only a minor something that happened, even if it wasn't a 20% drop in how much money they had sitting in their pot. There was a lack of trust. And that, those changes, or that, that behavioural change, preceded the changes which have been going on in the Netherlands over the last two or three years and leading to changes which actually have started to come through for real, which is they started to get away from this system. It wasn't going to work. Um, and they moved much closer to a, con and are moving much closer to conventional, C, uh, conventional DC. So yes, trust does matter. And even in these small cases, something happens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. We have got to 4.20. I did promise people we would draw things to a close. We've had an extraordinarily lively discussion, both in the questions here when people have unmuted themselves, but also on the chat. John, you'll get an opportunity uh, to read that chat. Uh, maybe you've had a chance that, to have a look at it. So thank you very much, John. You've generated a, an extraordinarily lively discussion on a very important subject, and I'm very thankful. I'm not surprised that you did that. Uh, and I'm very glad you shared your thoughts with us. And thank you, uh, everybody else, for joining us here at the Bremen Howard Centre this afternoon. Um, thank you, thank you very it, much, so, John. It, thank it, you, everybody so it's else. Just worth, is it worth saying, I'm not sure whether we've said this, that there will be a recording of the whole thing posted at some point. Is that right, David? There will indeed. You, you, you're quite right. And so um, that should be available uh, within within a few days. And I'm not sure, I think we'll... we'll um, 
Imperial be sending that out to everyone that's registered, do you think? Uh, I, we, we can do that. Um, and well, we, can, we can discuss that separately. But Yes, we can do that. And if you don't get an email, if you go to the Brevin Howard um, website, you'll be able to find it within, within a couple of days. Um, but we can certainly send out the links to, to, to everybody as well. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you again, John.